Crazy Stupid Podcast. As always, if this is your first time watching, we'd love for you to like and subscribe and hit the bell so that you are aware of when we post things. What's up? Welcome to... <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Hello and welcome to another episode of Crazy Stupid Podcast. And happy Black History Month. Yes. Yeah. Why did I just want to start doing <laughs> the VeggieTales thing? I would be like, welcome to VeggieTales, the show where we... Tell, what do they say after that? You are extremely hyper right now. <laughs> welcome do to drugs. another episode of... I didn't do any drugs. This is just me. <laughs> Shout out to Ronald Reagan. I'm high on life. Today, we are going to be talking about the next film that we are watching. But Oscar Watch. Yeah. We're, we're trying to watch all the movies, all the Best Picture nominees. What we've seen so far... American Fiction, Oppenheimer, Barbie, Past Lives, Close Up the Flyer Moon. What we still have to see is Zone of Interest, The Holdovers, which I want to do The Holdovers next. I really want to watch that movie. Okay. Anatomy of a Fall, Poor Things. Actually, I'm going to do that one next. I really want to watch that too. Maestro. And then if we have time, we should do Color Purple. Just. I'll be honest. I have no interest in watching Maestro, but I guess we I feel can. like we should do it just to do it, you know? Just feeling like we watched them all. Sure. All right. So Past Lives was directed by Celine Song, and it is about a young woman named Nora. Her original name is Na Zhang, mm -hmm. I believe. She immigrates with her family when she's uh, 12, I guess. I don't know. It is about her relationship to two different men. One is a childhood friend from South Korea who she had a really close friendship with and they had they liked each other and then they didn't see each other again for years after she left and then the other one she meets in new york while all this writer's residency and they end up getting married mm -hmm. i have to say this movie was described to me in a way that i think is inaccurate the way i heard it described was like it's a love triangle with no one to root against which is sort of true but in my mind what i was envisioning was like a bit more of a i thought it was gonna be like a high level rom-com mm. I thought it was like, oh my gosh, like it's gonna be sad because like you're gonna you're not gonna want anybody to lose out in the end and like she's gonna be torn and it's gonna be like, oh my gosh, who's she gonna pick type of thing? And that is not what this was. Yeah. That is not what this was at all. It was so much more. I guess we should say now we're gonna ruin the film, so go watch it. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna talk about the entire thing from beginning to end the opening of the film i don't know if you remember yeah i know oh my gosh the opening so they open with two voices disembodied voices don't know who they are doesn't matter but they're like a man and woman probably on a date and they're playing that game that people sometimes play where they see other strangers and they try to figure out like who they are to the other and the strangers are the three people of the film. I just thought that was brilliant because honestly in a different movie the two people talking would be the characters of the film. Like it'd be like oh we're about to see them on a date we're about to see their dynamic but no it opens with mystery. Mm. Who are these people? What are they to each other? What does this mean? And then she looks straight at the camera. There was a lot of little things that they did to make sure that this was not just like nothing wrong with rom-coms, but to make sure that this was not in that category. Yeah, It's trying to do more than tell a love story. There's a lot more at play. They hit every note. I thought it was so, so wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm glad they spent time giving the husband a lot of screen time. Mm -hmm. If they were not able to create empathy for him, I was never going to care about the scenes that they had mm -hmm. and the way that they did that was that they tied it with her story mm -hmm. you as an american being married to someone that's not from originally from america mm -hmm. and the ways that that shows up mm -hmm. uh, especially in areas with like when she like talks in her sleep she speaks in korean it's almost like they're exploring how in a lot of interracial couples where one of them is not from america the film does a good job of sort of showing the journey that couples have to take to make sure that when they don't have the same culture you got to have some really like uncomfortable conversations that if you don't it can really ruin your your relationship mm -hmm. or your marriage i should say i 100 percent agree because here's the thing when she decided to end things and then they introduced the husband i'm not gonna lie the first thought in my mind was like nobody to root against I was like, excuse me, I am in fact reading against this white man. It was the fact that in another movie, they would have tried to highlight what you just expressed about like that dynamic of like him being from a different culture, him not understanding the immigrant experience. And they would have used that to make the tension between them push you more towards Hey Sung. Yes. And they didn't do that. What they did was they very subtly showed us all the ways that he so intentionally did as much as he could to bridge that gap. They showed him speaking Korean. They told us that he, you know, has learned the games. He likes 
you know, a Korean food that according to Hey Sung, if he likes it, he's not playing around. I don't know what the food is, but I took that to mean like, okay, you're going above like surface level, which you buy mm-hmm. at like the, your local Korean Bonchon. shop. Right. Like <laughs> you, you really know your stuff. They made a point to show us like, yeah, that dynamic exists. And also he's doing everything he can to address it. It's not like some, you know, weird elephant in the room. The level of honesty that they have with each other. That's what I was going to get to next, but yeah. Cause that conversation that they had, the night she came back when he visited was so frank. It was like mm-hmm. every uncomfortable thought, every doubt that like you I you could understandably keep to yourself. Yeah. And just be like, I don't know if I, you know, sharing this might make things awkward. Like I don't want to make the, you know, things weird unnecessarily. They was like, no, they were both saying everything. When she was talking about the day with him, in my mind I was like, girl, maybe you, you talking too much. Like, can you stop? Like Yeah, I guess I'm kind of attracted to him. Huh? I was like, can you please, like, ma'am? Huh? <laughs> I was like, have some decorum. <laughs> Think about his feelings. But no, like, you you could see that it made him uncomfortable, but he very clearly was okay with that, and they yeah. sat in that. And he even named a lot of the things, like when he was talking about how, like, if this was a love story... He would be seen... Yeah, he was like, I'd be the evil white husband that you leave behind to mm-hmm. go back to your childhood love, to your, you know, your first love. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, because that's even the mindset I took into this film. Mm-hmm. Like, they named everything that you would expect and then just push it aside. I don't watch that many rom-coms for a number of reasons, but one of the main reasons if I sense that there's going to be a love triangle, I just I immediately tap out. And it's not because of like the cliche reasons, it's not because I'm trying to like avoid the drama or the feelings. It's just I can't look past who the first love uh-huh. interest is. You get is. attached. I, I, there's no way for me to look past that, mm-hmm. right? That has always been a thing. When I would hear people talk about like Katara and Zuko, in my mind, I was like, no, that doesn't make sense to me. I still root for them. But... Yeah, see, something's wrong with you. No, I'm just kidding. But like, I don't know how to I don't know how to put the original romance aside and try to see what perhaps the writer, the director is trying to get across next or my mind is it either goes to all right, hurry this up because I know this is just like a little distraction because you got to draw this out for like the finale or they move in this other direction where they keep going with this new interest because maybe the director felt like there was some real chemistry there and I tap out. It, they did that in Vampire Diaries. Originally, it was Stefan and Elena. And then Stefan's brother comes in and the, they did have amazing chemistry with Damon and Elena. And at that point, I was like, well, I, if this is the route you're going, I'm I'm out of here. Like, yeah. I can't. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> when they when they hinted with 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 uh, Ross and Rachel, when they hinted with Joey, I was like, nope, can't. Me can't too. do it. This is the other one recently. Katniss and Gail. Listen, I know that there are some huge PETA fans here. I am not one of them. I'm sorry. You I You need I, to I rewatch. Can't. You need to watch the very last one. I that's that's when it, they land the plane. Even like, when I watched the film for the first time, I still was not able to remove the 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 it feels like i made a binding vow <laughs> with, <laughs> with the, when like these two people are first introduced to me on this on the screen but ironically the only time it didn't happen it's gonna sound really cringe is in twilight <laughs> initially i had no i did not care about the two I don't remember what their names are. Edward and Bella? But Taylor's character as the werewolf, I was like, oh, I like their chemistry until I found out what the feelings were actually from. And then I was like, well, now I'm just up up in the head. Like, (laughs) it's over. I'm never trusting that again. (laughs) To me, okay. There, I do think there is an art. There is an art to to doing the the switcheroo. Okay. Mm. And who really does it well is authors and novels okay oh i have now read three novels this year three series this year where they have done this with drew fantasy novels love to do this i don't know why it's a little bit upsetting but i I, you have to trust the writer you have Mm. to trust them okay book talk will know what i'm talking about okay empyrean the imperior what is it whatever fourth wing and iron flame did this um Akatar did well i haven't read the second book but somebody spoiled it for me so i know they're gonna do this in Akatar. And then Legendborn, I think, is also about to do this. Don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. But I'm pretty sure they're about to do this in the in, in the next couple of books. But the, there is an art. And, and this is what the art is. The problem is the, the first one has to feel so, so good. Like, so perfect. Mm-hmm. Almost too perfect. Right? It's like 
it's, this is almost like too good. But you're so swept up in it, you're like, man, I don't care, like I just love this so much. And then when they introduce the other person, it's gotta be like, first of all, it has to be completely different. Like the dynamic, the dynamic has to be completely different, like jarringly different. And at first you're like, oh no. But then you start to realize, yeah, the first one is just like too good. Like it's too sweet. And it needs something like a little bit like of grounding. And then the mm. second person brings that grounding where like it just feels a little bit more real. And then you have to see that from the character's perspective. Like the character's feelings for that person, you, you, they have to sell you on it. Gotcha. If they do it right, you will completely change sides. Like your allegiance will shift immediately. And you'll be like, yeah, I don't care about Tamlin anymore. <laughs> Dane? Nope, you're, we want Zayden. Uh, you're saying people I don't know, but anyway. Book talk will know. Okay, yeah. That was the same thing with Issa and Lawrence. I remember when we first started watching Insecure, and obviously Twitter played a big role in just like the interactions. There are a lot of people that hated Lawrence, and I, I never understood that reaction. Cause like one, you could clearly see the brother was depressed. Like he was clearly yeah. not well. We talk a lot about like mental health and we wanting men to like show emotions. But I saw a lot of people, both men and women, that were dogging this guy. And it was like, y'all are doing a disservice to Issa's writing. Because yes. she was clearly trying to make a point about the mental health of black men. And y'all fell for it. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of the conversations around insecure were too service level. I think yeah. we didn't we didn't give the characters enough grace. And I think that the the show was pushing us to do that. Mm -hmm. And the conversations online were just very, but you know, that's also like Twitter dating culture and like the way that people talk about dating it, you know, on black Twitter in general, it was just kind of a mess. And so a lot of that spilled over. I also think though that the key thing that this film did really well is like, you have to love the woman in the center of the triangle and you have to love them so much that you're like, I'm just on your team and whoever you pick and are happy with, I'll be uh... happy. Cause that's how I felt with Issa. To me, I felt like I just really love Issa. And like, if she chooses Lawrence in the end, I'll be really happy. If she chooses Daniel, I'll be really happy. If she chooses, um, what's the guy that had Nate. bipolar? Nate. Like, I'll be really happy if she's happy. It was the same thing with Katniss. Like, I'm team Katniss, you know? Mm. The problem with Twilight is that Bella was like a shell of a person. She had no personality yeah. to like. So you couldn't be team Bella. You had to choose. But like, and some of these others, like, I'm on her side. Like, mm. I just like her. What I loved so much about this film and and the and Nora's character, Nora never doubts it. She is not the one asking questions at any point in the film. Every decision Nora makes throughout the film, she makes with complete confidence because she's choosing herself every time. Mm -hmm. She's team Nora. You even see it when they choose to move and the way that she talks about, you know, when she when they choose to when her family chooses to immigrate. Yeah. The way that she talks about it, it's like obviously she's going to miss her friends and family, but she has like a very like a confidence about it. Like she I mean, you know, she's a kid, so it's like, you know, high lofty sure. dreams, but she's like, "Listen, I'm trying to win a Pulitzer." And you can't get a Pulitzer if you're here. So I'm going over there to win a Pulitzer. And when they leave, you can see that when they part ways, you can sense that for him, this was like a like a shattering moment that he's like, you know, I'm saying goodbye to this friend. And for her, I think it was sad, but I think she's so like on her own side, on her own team, and not necessarily like revolving her life around other people at, in any way, shape or form that she's like, I actually know for a fact I'm gonna be okay. And I think that's why when she grows older, like she looks up to be like, yeah, who was that kid? You know, like as a joke, but he's been searching for her like he mm -hmm never mm -hmm. left and that's the same dynamic that they have every time that they meet up she is like i appreciate this person and i care deeply for this person and i really love this person but at the end of the day i'm doing what's best for me and he is like you're what's best for me it's not a lack of love and care for the person but it's a it's a love and care for the person that's balanced with her own love for herself they did a really good job at showing us the husband really knew her yep and the, like one scene where they you know they talked about with is it hey song the guy mm -hmm. where he would say like yeah she used to be a crier and there'd be times where like i wouldn't know what to do so i would just kind of stand there and wait for her to finish crying mm -hmm. but in the end of the film that's not what the husband did he actually embraced her mm -hmm. as opposed to 
what Hei Sung did. And I don't like, obviously, I think that was probably the best way Hei Sung probably knew how to support her. Mm -hmm. He was a child. Yeah. But in that instance, that that was one of the things that sold like, oh, you like, you know what she needs. Mm -hmm. I love like little moments like that where I was like, you get her. Yeah. And I feel like I needed that in order for me to care about him. The film is called Past Lives because they cop they talk about that concept of Inyun. Mm. right which is like that whole idea of like when two people come together in this life it's because like they have this history of all these past lives where like they've been something important to each other and like their souls are intertwined for forever yeah the way that they describe it in the film is that it's like it's basically saying like people have like a one true soulmate mm -hmm. right of like this one person that in every single iteration of your lives you find each other but what the film kind of does with that is they turn it on its head and the film uses that to make the argument that there isn't a one true soulmate. Your souls, maybe they tie, are tied together, but it doesn't mean that there is this one romantic person for you that you must be and will al always find in that same way in every life again and again and again. To me, it's making the point of like, there's like all these alternate pathways that life could have taken you. and it could have been equally as good because that's the thing like at the end they definitely sold what you're saying about the husband holding her at the end i agree it's very impactful i also don't think that the film was ever trying to convince us that hey son couldn't have worked for her yeah i think this film was trying to say that like there is a life where they could have been just as happy with each other mm -hmm. and they could have been perfectly happy that's just not the life that happened yeah and that's fine mm -hmm. they are where they're supposed to be it's more about like alternate lives the way i thought of it got a multiverse kind, not multiverse yeah. but like when the moms take nora and Sung on that date when they're kids and they're talking and they're talking about how they're going to immigrate and she asks you know why and everything and she's like you know you guys basically saying like you guys are like you know you have solid careers like why would you give all of that up mm -hmm. and the mom's response is that whenever something is lost something is gained too i thought of that episode of rami where they talk about immigration and they kind of talk about how like we think about it as like this destined path that like you know people are making it to you know america the land of american dream baby right and they he kind of outlines is like you should be able to live that life where you are coming from mm -hmm. right and so to me the film was sort of about how like when people do choose to make that journey there is like an alternate version of their life that is lost yeah and it's not necessarily a negative like like the mom says you gain something too but like there there is like this cost of like something else that could have been that you just won't know because you're entering into this whole new world into a whole new version of yourself even like they gave us a little bit when they when she was going to the auditions she was they were auditioning parts for the play that she wrote and the dialogue that the woman is saying is like you know it costs you something to come here and see this play about the play i believe is kind of like her life story mm. like this play about this you know korean woman like you paid the ticket you paid the parking whatever whatever and she's like it cost me something too to be here in front of you and i feel like the film is showing us it's like a glimpse into like this is the cost right like this is the the alternative that could have been this life with Sung, and also something was gained with this life that she got to live in america with her husband because normally the way that the conversation of immigration is sort of framed low-key can feel a little xenophobic yeah in that it it sort of perpetuates the idea of these countries being below us yeah when in reality you could find a very valuable and wholesome life if you had not left mm -hmm. you, you can get something in either way that you go yes. and that you know, the film does a good job at sort mm -hmm. of portraying that obviously you know my parents sort of migrated here there is a piece that gets left in the country you immigrate from and like obviously there's like a very healing process of being able to go back and when i see my family do that there is like a recharge that i would see mm. in them right it's not that they're not happy in the states but it is hard to bring your whole self from your home country here because it's just that's not where you're from. This film does a good job at sort of showing it is possible for you to do that. I think it's my favorite. I don't. I mean, we've only seen half, so maybe it'll change, but it's gonna be hard to top. Do you think it? It you felt more with this than in Oppenheimer? Because that's what I'm. I'm comparing everything to Oppenheimer to me. Yes, I think I did. Mm. I had 
thought about this movie for several days after we watched it, but I had I never cried at the end of a film simply because of how good it is, except for Oppenheimer. Like that was the first time I experienced like I'm just in awe of like this masterpiece that I watched. And so like it's it's going to be hard for me to compare it to that because I, I put that reaction above everything else because I had never experienced that before. I don't know if that makes sense. It does make sense. I think I feel like Oppenheimer made me feel things, like you said, because it was so good. It's like the idea of the film is what made me feel like, oh my gosh. Past Lives made me feel something because the message of the film was so good. And to me, that's more impactful. What about American fiction? I felt more at the end of past, I loved American fiction. I had a lot of thoughts. I think that's what I would say. I think I had a very- Very thought provoking, introspective. Yeah, that American fiction, it made me think more, which I like and I value a lot in a film and I loved that I loved that film. I think past lives made me feel more. I don't I don't know. I'm not saying it should win. I'm just saying I like my personal feelings on which one I love more don't necessarily mean which one I think should win. Like Oppenheimer winning Best Picture makes sense to me because it's like, you know, the cultural impact that it had. Sure. And this the way that it's a culmination of no you know, like all of his Yeah. Yeah. I I I will not be upset if that movie wins at all. Okay. True Detective. Want to tell you something, Jodie Foster? Is she acting down? Love this season so far, which, I mean, it, it's been hard to top season one because season one is just fucking goaded. Tell me, okay, season one is Matthew McConaughey and who? Woody Harrelson. Okay, season two is the one we nobody watches with Rachel McAdams and Taylor Kish. The dude from Friday Night Lights. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know, remember what his last name I is. I think it's Taylor Kish. Mm -hmm. and, then the la and then the third season, Idris? Is Idris no. in True Detective? <laughs> no, Mahershala Ali. Oh, it's Mahershala What a Ali. racist. <laughs> All black people love I'm not going to lie to you. They do They do exist in like the same spot in my brain. One is British, one's American. I know, but it's kind of <laughs> like, they, first of all, first of all, I didn't know Idris Elba was British for a long time because he only played black Americans. I didn't know about Luther. I didn't watch Luther. So I was You've never, you have, till this day, you still haven't watched it? I like seen episodes, but I never like got into it enough to watch it. Anyways, so yeah, that was season three and then this okay. season four so there's just a few things first this season of true detective is actually really interesting because they're making a lot of connections to season one so the first thing you actually noticed it the spiral time is a flat circle it shows up it that symbol is what showed up in season one first thing second thing is they mentioned the tuttles that was the villain or like the antagonist. They're clearly telling us that these seasons exist in the same universe. And I'm pretty sure we've gotten mentions of season one a couple of other times in some of the other seasons. In what context do they mention the Tuttles? I don't remember. I, I want to go and rewatch. It showed up, I think, at episode one or two. Mm. But this is the one that really got me. So when when Fiona Shaw's character is talking to the officer, the, the indigenous officer, she's talking about like her husband or her partner that you know they, it sort of gives the feeling that they're like kind of on and off mm -hmm. and then the last thing she says is one last gift from travis cole now who is travis cole travis cole is the father of matthew mcconaughey's character rust cole if you rewatch season one mcconaughey's character says that his dad went off and left and was living in alaska oh wow mm -hmm. i'm thoroughly enjoying it i think it might end up being my i haven't seen the season so it could be just recency bias like i haven't seen the others in a long time i see how they land the plane too and i didn't watch season two i think i skipped it entirely season three was good season three was very was good season two was not good I never finished season two. Yeah, it wasn't good. Right now, it feels like it's my favorite. I don't mm. know. I just because there's so many ladies, that might really be it. Yeah, I mean, that's a fine <laughs> reason. Yeah. I think I, man, I feel like Jodie Foster is really, she's doing her big one in this. Like, I feel like she's- You think this is Emmy worthy? I think so. I think she's in her bag. I think that th this character, because there are so many ways that she could have written this character off as like, she's like- so on the surface level, sometimes she seems a little racist, okay? Oh my gosh, yeah. But I don't think she is. I have thoughts about this. But on the surface level, she seems like she's a little racist. I mean, the impact she, of what she's doing, it, it's, just, it's racist. Whether You know what I mean? Like, it's, Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. If we want to talk about like impact versus intent, yeah. Yes. But I do think her intent matters. Yeah, that's fair. But, you know, she come, comes off like a little racist. She comes off like, mm, just like rough you know just like not very em empathetic mm -hmm. somebody like it could very easily just be like i don't really like you very much as a character and i 
get pushed to that point sometimes and then Jodie Foster just brings me back and I'm like oh there's something about her that I really respect yeah, 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 there's yeah, something yeah. about her that I really like respect even when she's at her worst and I think that's a hard thing to do and portray and I think Jodie Foster is doing a very good job and this character is different than a lot of characters I've seen like she's played detective before obviously Silence of the Lambs mm -hmm. it's so different the character that she was playing right now from the character in Silence of the Lambs so I really think she's doing her big one I think there's just, I, I, I love it and I think the more we uncover about her character the more some of her choices will make sense i think we have to know what happened to her ex-husband that'll be revealed at some point yeah i think a lot of her behavior is coming from that but also like even the stuff with her stepdaughter and like the inupak tattoos and when she like freaked out that's when i was like maybe not dragged her to the bathroom that's when I'm like nah maybe i hate this one i think your empathy level is a bit higher for her than me because <laughs> well, of that scene I what did it for me was when they they immediately after that they showed her looking at images of annie k hmm. and annie k had the same things she's sure. afraid for her for her stepdaughter yeah i don't think she's i don't think she hates it because it's like there's indigenous markings i don't like it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think she's afraid of her daughter reconnecting with it too much because she doesn't want her, what happened to annie k to happen to her daughter that's what allowed me to be a little bit more like okay like you definitely are doing a lot of harm right now in the way that you are expressing these emotions but i think that the reason why you express things like that is because you're grieving and you have not unpacked some things so we're we're watching true detective and you brought up when you saw the oranges okay in white lotus mm -hmm. that lady who died somebody on like tiktok said that they had predicted she was going to die a long time ago and they predicted it because there was all these instances where they had her wearing orange or with oranges or on the cover she was mm. by oranges because apparently this is like a recurring thing that's been that shows up in film going back decades that yeah. like oranges are meant to be like a foreshadow of death so even in um bullet train at the end somebody gets hit by a truck and the truck is filled with oranges mm. i want to say in the good place i might be wrong but in the good place when the main character when she dies is in a grocery store and i'm pretty sure there's like oranges in her cart that fall like it's like a thing that they yeah. do so apparently the first film that it took place in was the godfather oh okay so that's yeah, all a call back yeah, to yeah, that yeah. it happened where in a number of instances where like a character gets off oranges someone's eating it or it drops from like a like a crate but what's fascinating though is when they served it like a behind the scenes the production design person never intended it to have that kind of symbolism but it's like a coincidence. It, yeah it sort of picked up and then the film bros loved it and now it's sort of stuck it's been reoccurring in in hollywood ever since so i thought that that was very funny i'm very scared for evangeline yeah i i don't think they'll kill her but I don't like that that orange thing happened. The second thing was this season is doing a really good job in showing you how closely tied climate change is to indigenous people's stories. Mm -hmm. And they're doing a really good job at showing you just the culture that a lot of indigenous people have with their ties to nature in general and how a lot of that gets disrupted due to just the industrialization that like American society has had in a lot of places. And the idea of like, hey, you know, infancy rates is, is being questionable in that story, primarily because of what they're doing to their water and food. So I actually tried to do some research on like, is that like a real thing that sort of happens? And like in, in a lot of places, I think I read somewhere in like Arizona, very alarming concerns of like the mortality rate for like indigenous babies because of things that are happening in climate change. That was sort of shocking. And it's just like a reminder of like, when I think about climate change, I know that it's happening, but in terms of like severe conditions in America, I tell it myself it, it hasn't happened yet, right? Yeah. But it's like a reminder that indigenous people keep telling us that like, we keep getting forgotten in spaces, in conversations, in books, in history. And like now, like in the present day, like that doesn't get talked about enough of how vile, like even in our own country, something like climate change, which the show is doing a good job at critiquing how we sort of react to it. And we've like poured our entire economy into a resource that's gonna end up destroying the planet. It's not something that's future tense, it's it's present tense. And they're, they're showing like a specific community that's probably being impacted the worst right now. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciated that. Being impacted the worst and also ha is like s just so easily ignored, like just not mm -hmm. heard. Like there's, yeah, people just don't listen. We're getting the Avatar Last Airbender. There's a live action that Netflix is doing. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, the more I hear about this show, the more concerned I'm getting. <laughs> we don't and need it. Listen, 
I was keeping my hopes up because I, I saw that like, but then I, I saw that the original creators of the show that were involved and were going to do live action, they stepped away and they okay. brought in someone else. Mm -hmm. So here's a couple of things that I found out. One, they're either dimming down or they're removing Sokka's uh, misogyny that he sort of portrayed to his sister, to a lot of women in the show, which I feel like that's too important. Like that's like, that was like a major growth thing for him in the show. So now I'm like, what are they gonna do with his character? Cause like, that's his arc. So now it's gonna probably, like I'm concerned that it'll feel unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. Then the, I, I read another thing that they said they're gonna take out some of like the gender role dynamics that Katara was sort of at the forefront of in combating, which again, I'm like, why? It's something they're like, they're like trying to remove what they feel like is problematic or something? I don't know, but even in the animation, they never like normalized it. They were always critiquing it. Yeah, I will say, I think that this is a cartoon that a, a live action adaptation is difficult because they were able to do a lot of this stuff while still making the characters very lovable and likable mm -hmm. because of like the goofiness of the characters, right? Like Sokka had huge issues, but like he was still very lovable. Like I loved him. He was like my favorite from the beginning, even when he was saying like really annoying yeah. things because it's just like the goofiness of a cartoon. Like you can kind of do things like that yes, that's that true. don't translate well. So I feel like if they were to try to portray some of that stuff with Sokka, his character would just come off as like an asshole. But what about like Michael Scott though? I, is that the tone that they're going for? No, I'm I'm saying, I, I don't think that's a tone. I'm just saying I, that that's who I thought of as in it is possible to do it. I guess in my mind. That's maybe it's true. maybe it's not a fair comparison, but it is. But that is also like a comedy. So you like that show is also extremely goofy. You know. Well, yeah. So was Last Airbender. That's what I'm saying. But I feel like a live adaptation of The Last Airbender. Oh, I see. What you I mean. don't think they're trying to do that. To me, what I think is happening is they are writing this as like a dramatized mm -hmm, version mm -hmm. of the cartoon. Yeah. So I think they're going to make it, and it could still be good, it just won't be like, it won't be the same. But like, I think that they are making it like a more serious and like centrally focused adventure yeah. drama show. Because they did say that they're actually gonna portray what happens to the airbenders, where in the animation, it's it's Just strongly implied, implied yeah. of what sort of takes place. I think they're trying to they're making it more serious. Yeah. So which, maybe yeah. Okay. We, we just we go in I'll, I'm going to go in with open, you know, with an open mind, but I don't know. But and then there was, you know, there was also some conversations about the original creators were clearly trying to show like the water tribe being like indigenous, but they didn't I guess they didn't cast indigenous characters for it or i think they might have but they're like very they're very light yeah oh okay or like okay. one of them might be mixed i can't have to look up the casting again but I, people were upset when they showed the casting because it's like in the cartoon like those are very brown people yeah yeah and like the <laughs> casting people don't look that brown i don't know we'll so see. i don't we'll know see. now that i've been reading so much this year and i've re read so many stories that i feel like i just i'm like okay like we're remaking another thing for avatar the last air but we're remaking percy jackson and the oh, olympians yeah. like we're oh, doing all this oh, stuff oh, 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 and it's Jackson's like really i'm not saying it's bad i'm yeah, not I'm, saying that the show is bad <laughs> I, I, really I believe love percy jackson <laughs> i believe that the show is good i believe the show is good and i understand <laughs> that the movies did not do it justice and that's that's all fair and valid i just also am like we right now have like some very big fantasy series young adult fantasy series that feature young black women that they have been whispering and talking about, they've bought the right zoo, they've talked talking about turning them into shows or movies, and it's crickets, nothing's happening. Mm. Children of Blood and Bone, crickets. That that was years ago that I read that they were gonna take that and turn it into something, and I haven't heard a thing. No updates. No updates. And it was originally Dis Disney who had it, and then they sold it to somebody else. Fine, make Percy Jackson. I don't have a problem being Percy Jackson. I just, I'm also like, Percy Jackson already had an adaptation. Okay, it wasn't good. I know it wasn't good. I know people who read the books are gonna be like, it doesn't count fair. But like, I just, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, and then we have Legend Born too, which is another young adult series that has, that is about a young black woman that has, it is ripe. It is, it is ripe for mm. a, vis, uh, a visual adaptation, film, show, whatever it is. Like I was saying before, I think an animated series would be so good. And it's just like, I, I heard that somebody bought the rights for that too. I heard said that there they was cricket, they were, they was talking about that too. And nothing, you know, so it's like, I'm cool. I'm obviously like, I'm glad that, you know, this Avatar Less Airbender, even if, even if the indigenous representation is not what we would like, 
there's there is a lot of like Asian representation sure, yeah. that I think is va- valid and I and I like and I want it to happen. And also, there's like just all these other stories that haven't had anything yet. You sort of touched on live adaptations, and this was something I I've seen some people sort of talk about. It's going to fill up a bit of like a tangent, so but it will make sense in a second. So obviously, House of Dragons coming back in the summer, and obviously you know that I'm like I'm a I'm a fucking fanatic. <laughs> I'll I'll own it. I'll own it I'll, as as I do own all of the books. So you, you know they race swapped House Valarian. They weren't supposed to be black, and that does change significantly parts of the story particularly with Rhaenyra and her kids there's a lot more ambiguity about like are the strong boys her sons because like obviously they're all white and so in the books yeah so it's not going to be as like simple and so you know their hair is different but there are other examples in Targaryen history where that sort of happened and so like that makes it kind of like "Mm, I don't know is it so you're sort of left to like sort of in many ways decide for yourself and really question Allison's motives behind why she would make the accusations Mm -hmm. but one of the things that i was sort of thinking about why i'm fine with that race swap here's what i'll say i know that there are concerns about like race swapping and and gender swapping and people will typically respond with that by saying like just make your own stories and i am not against that i i think there are a lot of stories for black and brown asian indigenous people that have not been brought to the big screen or have not had a live adaptation for television that should at the same time i do think I'm, I'm i'm choosing my words carefully because i'm not saying that i condone all versions of like race swapping and that we shouldn't try to push companies to take risk and do stories for people of color that are new i'm simply saying i do think there is a very clear level of privilege that white people have due to the fact that they are represented in some of the most famous ips that we have right now due to the history of segregation in art and in Hollywood in our country's history. When a lot of these stories were written, whether it's in a film, in a comic, in a book, all of that was very Eurocentric. All of that was very exclusionary for for people of color. And so these white characters have a very long legacy that sort of has kept a, a, like a familiarity in the eyes of the public. You know what I mean? Like you're always going to get a Superman. You're always going to get a Batman. You're always going to get a Wonder Woman. You're always going to get all of the five Avengers. You're, you know what I mean? Lord of the Rings, the main characters for the trilogy, white people. That familiarity right now in the era that we're in, when we're getting the same kind of remakes and spinoffs and, you know, redos for movies and TV shows, you've got a lot of companies that are like playing it safe. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I don't always fault the studios for wanting to find ways to be inclusive due to the era of familiarity that we're in right now. Yeah. And so, you know what I mean? So I, I do think like with Corliss Valar, with, with the Valarians being changed black, that does change the story. I think what I have thought about for me personally is what matters more. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's valuable for people of color to be represented in one of the biggest IPs in the history of the world with the Song of Ice and Fire, where on the flip side to that, it does change the story a bit where you have to make some adjustments or do we completely just exclude them out out of some of the biggest stories that will ever exist in comics, in fiction, in fantasy, simply because of our country's history and how Eurocentric a lot of the writers were when these original stories were created. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's not something I see people talk about often. It's just a matter of make your own stories, make your own stories. And so people will probably bring that up and say like, all right, but what if we like casted a white person for Black Panther? And I just feel like one, you're, you're being disingenuous. But at the same time, that's one black character compared to the plethora that is beyond unequitable, regardless of how you try to spin it. Yeah. That I think is the difference because people will normally bring up the idea of like, yeah, if a person that is black, that in the story they used to be white, the their race was not a factor in the story. But I don't always know if that is always the necessary argument we need to make. I think a valid argument could be whether or not their race is necessary. People of color have been consistently excluded out of some of the biggest IPs in art in stories just due to the history of racism of when these stories were very seen as very eurocentric Mm -hmm. 
I don't see people talk about that enough. I agree. I think if you are a person that's saying like, just make your own stories, just make your own stories. My next question to you is how many stories, original stories about people of color are you personally supporting and reading and taking in the content for? Right. To, um, increase their chances of getting this attention and getting these adaptations right like because mm -hmm. the stories are being created they've been being created for decades upon decades upon decades they've always been there there's always black people have always wrote about black people mm -hmm. like that's a we've always done that we've always made movies about black. we've always done that the problem is our stories don't always get the traction Oh, it's, and, and the attention because you guys don't want to watch them. Exactly. So if, if you're a person who's like, make your own stuff, okay, well then support our stuff. Right. Support our stuff. One. Two, does the race swap actually change the story? Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, Megan and Harry's child looks like a white baby. <laughs> okay. And it's the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> that I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Ra Rhaenyra's children are one quarter black. <laughs> They're one quarter. <laughs> Does it actually change the story that much? I don't think so. It's plausible that her children could actually look white. Like it's extremely, extremely plausible. <laughs> no, you say paper bag test. It's like <laughs> one drop rule. <laughs> I'm I, that's the first thing. Cause here's the thing. Listen, because. Meg, Harry's parent, there was people in the in the world court were like, I don't know, what's the baby gonna look like? That child is white with red <laughs> hair. <laughs> he is white with red hair because he's a quarter black. Yeah, but, but <laughs> I mean, you brought up a point Sorry. that I thought was important. No, 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 you're fine. You brought up a point that I thought was important. Black stories don't get the traction, but I also think they are not given the luxury of making a mistake during trying to mm -hmm. become a live adaptation because game of thrones could have felt well it did the pilot yeah. episode for game of thrones was terrible and and they, and they all it. promised each other we will never release it to the public no one will ever know how bad that pilot episode was and to be honest they were still like we're going to go through with it but that is not the reality for a lot of, of black stories. There's always this sort of risk of like, oh, if it's not good, I mean, and it puts the pressure on us, like we gotta go watch it, we gotta yep. go watch it, because if it flops, we'll never they won't get, get the chance one. to do it. I mean, from the exact same network, HBO, rap shit just got canceled. Right. I mean, I personally didn't need a second season of this show, but um, Lovecraft Country was canceled after its first season. Mm -hmm. It says a lot. Because we don't get that luxury, I am always gonna try to have a nuanced take when a race swap happens because sometimes that might be our best chance of representation. Yeah. Race swapping is not this new woke thing that has happened in like the last like two years. Brandy was Cinderella and she's black. Also- That we'll, entire movie was just a giant race swap. <laughs> Wil Wilson Fisk in the Ben Affleck Daredevil was a black man. This is not a new thing. I promise you, if you were to really look hard enough, you would find they actually did quite a few race swapping in the last 20, 40 years. But I just wanted mm. to add that in there. Not a new thing. That's yeah. your, the revisionist history that you're listening to some crazy conservative. That now you're suddenly mad. The outrage over The Little Mermaid was kind of wild. Yo, that was <laughs> crazy. I was like, listen, I love The Little I love the original Little Mermaid. I still like the original Little Mermaid better than the live adaptation. Love Hallie, but like, I still like sure. the original better. I just can't imagine being that upset. I think the, the reason why I asked it the way that I did is if he's try if he was inspired by like a certain era of medieval time, okay, fine. But the, the question that I am posing is, do you think there is value in adjusting it for the day and age that we're in right now with trying to right the wrongs of the culture America had about being very exclusionary? That I think I think I would I would like for people to sit with that because the the reaction, the response is normally the author wrote that person white. And for a person of color, my response is yes. And that was a very problematic norm for a lot of fiction and fantasy and comic books of that time. Right. We won't be able to go back and, and rewrite history, but we can adjust it for now, now because we're in an era where we don't have to adhere to that culture. The black fact that people, people could not imagine black people in these worlds is not justification. 
Yeah. The, like the fact that at the time, because that's that's really all it is. Like, sure, you can say he based it on a certain whatever, whatever. If you are imagining a world of dragons and magic and white and white walkers, and you can imagine all of this, and you cannot imagine a world in which black people do not exist outside of roles of servitude, because that's all we had. We had mm, what's her name? Sunday. The Sunday and 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 Grey Worm. If you cannot imagine black people into this fantastical reality outside of roles of servitude, that's a problem. I also, I'm like, guys, like. I was going to say period, but it looks like you had another point to me. Sorry. <laughs> it's not like they took the 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 leading cast members. Yeah, they're all still white. Like, they, they took a side. To, they, when I saw the season and I saw the amount of screen time that these characters had, which I, I hear that it's going to increase, whatever. But when I saw the amount of screen time that these characters had, I was like, this is what we were mad about? I thought they were doing something big, revolutionary, taking so like, like no, like they, they no. he's a side. They're a side character. Well, this is this is part of why I, I'm always as much as I love the books. I'm a little protective of the show because Bela and Reyna in in the story they they have maybe like one or two major moments, but from what I picked up in that trailer, it looks like they're going to give them a lot more screen time mm. in the show. Which, because that, you know, there's more representation, like, I appreciate that. Right. To see more black people in that fantasy element on, like, one of the biggest shows ever, like, that matters to me. Even if that changes in your mind the lore, even though George R. R. Martin did say, like, he was perfectly fine and loved the casting for who they had with Corliss Villarin, but I just throw that in there. He ate the roll up. So that's where I'm like, See, I'm going to find value in that change. Yeah. You know what I mean? I honestly think that a lot of a lot of white men should sit with the fact of like I am 28, about to be 29 years old and like this summer will be the first time I've ever seen someone who looks like me riding a dragon. Right. Like I don't people I don't think people really understand how hard it was growing up to be like a black girl in particular into like action movies and fantasy you're nowhere to be found they'll sprinkle in a black man here or there okay they put they they'll they'll, they'll put them in sometimes it, mm. it's not enough it's not enough and it's always we get something you know yeah i didn't exist in star wars i didn't exist in lord of the rings i was non-existent in all of these stories i was non-existent in in most of the marvel movies up until black panther like i'm just not there so like I really think some people should sit with it and just be like, this is very meaningful for me as a grown adult woman to be like, wow, like for the first time, like there, there I am, there I am in this fantasy world riding a dragon and I'm still not even a secondary character. I'm whatever's after that. Like, yeah. like you know what I mean? Like, I'm, so I'm just stop being greedy. <laughs> <laughs> Share. Like there is a whole monopolizing <laughs> that you all have in so many fandoms you will not lose that much if 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 they swap out one or two characters yeah like you, you're gonna be okay like all right y'all want to thank you all so much for tuning in and we will see you all next time peace